All right, I'd like to welcome everyone to the third Lunch and Learn session. Today, our speaker is Ethan Corazon. He's recently elected to the Kansas State Senate starting in only a few days now, from now, January, 2021. He's has lots of spirit experience as an attorney, but we're not gonna hold that against him. Instead, we're going to, he's going to be talking about his experience with working for voter rights and increased voter participation. He has uh, a lot of experience both working for President Obama's re-election campaign and then for local uh, elections in Kansas. And at this point, I'll turn it over to Ethan. If, if you have any questions, by the way, please save them for the end. And then I'm sure Ethan will be happy to answer them. If not, his mother-in-law will be more than happy to answer. <laughs> Anything related to our grandson, I will let Lori answer. <laughs> is it our grandson or is it her grandson? Well, her grandson, my son. Uh, so no, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate this opportunity. Um, I've been working in voting rights for about a decade. And so I'm excited to share with you some of my experiences and observations about uh, what's going on uh, sort of nationally across the landscape. It's an issue that we've heard a lot about uh, recently. And so I'm excited to get a chance to talk about it. Um, I want to do three things today. First, I was just going to share with you my personal experience with voting rights. Uh, second, I want to talk about some of the ways that we continue to see voter suppression activities across the country. And third, I want to talk about what each of us can do to improve voting accessibility. So I really got involved in voting rights mostly by accident. Um, I was an attorney at a law firm in Washington, DC, and I decided that I wanted to make it my mission uh, to work on President Obama's reelection campaign in 2012. Um, except the only problem I kept running into is that I really wasn't qualified for any positions with the campaign. Um, so I kept talking to people about ways I could get on the campaign or different roles that I could fill. And finally, I heard that they were hiring attorneys uh, to do something called voter protection. So I thought this is finally something I found something that I'm qualified for where I could add value to the campaign. So really through a friend, I got hired to be the deputy voter protection director for the campaign in Madison, Wisconsin. So I was Deputy Voter Protection Director, moved to Wisconsin where I never really uh, spent much time. And I was the voter protection, Deputy Voter Protection Director. Um, so my role on that campaign really was twofold. Uh, first, I focused on helping educate voters about Wisconsin's recently enacted photo ID requirement. And I'm gonna talk more about the suppressive effect of photo ID requirements in a minute, um, but Wisconsin had just enacted a photo ID requirement and it was facing a host of legal challenges. And so my job was to educate voters about that this new law had been passed, what they needed to bring with them in order to vote in terms of photo identification, what sorts of identifications were permitted, um, and then how they could obtain a photo identification if they did not already have one. And the second thing that we did was we recruited, trained, and organized over a thousand workers to work at polling locations uh, across the state and to be sort of our eyes and ears on the ground uh, to let us know if there were any problems at the polls. So they were focused on things like letting us know if there were long lines at a polling location, um, if there were broken machines, if there were poll workers who were not well-trained, who were misapplying the law, um, or if there were not enough ballots. We've actually, believe it or not, had instances where turnout was higher than expected and polling locations uh, ran out of ballots. And so we wanted to have folks at uh, as many polling locations across the state as we could to make sure that voting went smoothly. And I'm actually here today because of that experience. So um, on the campaign, one of my best friends became a um, a, a, a friend named Jason Gray, who was one of Jenna's best friends from college. And so I was actually introduced to Jenna by Jason. So um, I'm doing this lunch and learn today because of that work on the campaign, because that's 
how I met Jenna. We met at President Obama's inauguration in January of 2013 um, and have been together ever since. So the campaign was a good experience for a lot of reasons, uh, one of them being how I met Jenna. Um, so after the campaign, I was back at my law firm in Washington, D.C., and in what turned out to be just a really fortunate coincidence, I got a call one day um, that our firm on a pro bono basis had partnered with um, a host of civil rights organizations to challenge Wisconsin's photo ID law in uh, federal court. And they wanted to know if I would be part of that legal team since I had just rejoined the firm after serving on this role on the campaign. And uh, this experience working on this case was really eye-opening for me in terms of understanding the suppressive effect of these photo ID laws. Um, I'm guessing that most of us on this Zoom meeting have uh, a photo ID or a driver's license that in normal times we would use to get on planes. We'd have it with us when we're driving. And so we don't understand just how onerous these laws can be for certain segments of our population. Um, but the reality is that in most states, there are literally hundreds of thousands of people who do not have the kind of government issued photo identification um, that these laws require. And there is an undeniable racial component to these laws. Um, testimony at our trial from our expert showed that African Americans in Wisconsin were 40% more likely than whites not to have one of the required forms of photo identification that they needed to show in order to be able to vote. Um, Latino voters were 2.3 times more likely than whites to not have one of the required forms of photo identification. And there are actually many reasons why uh, it is hard to obtain uh, this, these photo IDs uh, for certain segments of the population. So DMVs tend to only be open during certain hours. They tend to not have weekend hours. They're only open during business hours where oftentimes it can be difficult to take off of work for several hours to get to a DMV, to wait in line for several hours during the middle of the day and then get back to your job. Um, DMVs oftentimes are not convenient for folks who rely on public transportation. They're often not near um, public transportation. Uh, in Wisconsin, and this was mostly in rural areas, 25% um, of DMVs were open fewer than one day per month. And so if you weren't able to make it on this one day per month, you were really in a difficult situation. But most importantly, more important than any of those things is that many voters lack the birth certificate or similar documentation that is needed to obtain a state ID. So if you think about older voters or voters born in another state, this is, can be a really costly and time consuming activity that requires them to spend countless hours um, waiting through government bureaucracies in order to secure these underlying documents that they need to then go get the photo ID that they need to vote. Um, for many African-American residents uh, in a state like Wisconsin, um, Wisconsin has a large percentage of African-Americans who migrated north, uh, but who were born in the South uh, during Jim Crow when blacks were not admitted to hospitals. So they were born at home to midwives. And so simply put, they never had a birth certificate. For, for many of these folks, uh, they never had a birth certificate in the first place, but we're now in a position where they needed a birth certificate in order to get a photo ID. Um, it also became really clear to me over the course of working on this case that there is simply no voter fraud. Um, statistically speaking, our expert testified that you are more likely to be struck by lightning than you are to be a victim of voter fraud. Um, and the state of Wisconsin actually admitted at trial that they could not, in fact, identify a single case of voter fraud. Uh, the largest study to date that we have actually came from New York. It came from uh, the Brennan Center for Justice 
in New York, which looked at uh, a host of elections that took place from 2000 to 2014. During the course of these elections, more than 1 billion ballots were cast, billion with a B, and they found 31 credible, not proven, but 31 even credible cases of possible voter fraud out of more than 1 billion ballots that were cast. Um, two, two witnesses from trial really stuck out to me and I still remember their testimony. Um, so I wanna share with you uh, their testimony. The first was a gentleman named Eddie Lee Holloway. So Mr. Holloway moved to Wisconsin from Illinois uh, in 2008. He'd been a regular voter in Illinois and had been a regular voter in Wisconsin until the state passed the photo ID law. So when he found out that this photo ID law went into effect, he wanted to get a state issued photo ID so he could continue to be a voter in Wisconsin. Uh, he brought with him to the Milwaukee DMV his expired Illinois photo ID, his a birth certificate and his social security card to get an ID for voting. Uh, the DMV rejected his application because the name on his birth certificate had Eddie Jr. Holiday instead of Eddie Lee Holloway, which was a 58 year old clerical heir. Uh, he had a clerical heir on his birth certificate uh, from when he was born 58 years ago. So Mr. Holloway was denied the photo ID that he needed uh, in order to vote. He was still determined though to continue to be a voter. Uh, he then went to the vital records uh, office to try to fix his birth certificate. And he was told that that would cost him between $400 and $600 to make this change to his birth certificate. He did not have this that, that much money uh, he was a retired cook who was living on disability, so he did not have the $400 to $600 that it would require. So he was still determined to vote, though, uh, and he thought that maybe it would be cheaper if he were able to go through Illinois, which is a state that he were born, that maybe it'd be more affordable for him to make this change to his birth certificate. So he purchased a $180 round-trip bus ticket to go from Wisconsin to Springfield, which is where the Illinois Vital Records Office was. Um, and because they told him that he had to personally come there to amend a birth certificate. So when he got there, he was told that he needed to additionally have his high school records and his vaccination records. So he then paid a friend $20 in gas money to drive him to Decatur, Illinois, which is where these records were. So he procured copies of his high school records and his vaccination records, returned to the vital records office in Springfield, only to be told that he actually needed his full social security statement in order to change his birth certificate, which he did not have. So after this whole ordeal, Mr. Holloway went back to Wisconsin, uh, still without making this change to the birth certificate that he needed to get the state ID that would require him to continue to vote, which he had done for decades. On the bottom shelf. So Ms. Mr. Holloway was still determined. He procured two copies of his full social security statement, um, called the vital records office in, in Illinois, and they said that he could not fax or email them to them. He had to come back to Springfield in person with his full social security statement. Uh, Mr. Holloway then testified that he did not have money to buy another $180 bus ticket. And so at that point, he sadly gave up trying to vote, um, which he had done for decades. No, 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 no. Um, so this was after spending $200, um, visiting two different states, and making seven different trips to uh, different public uh, institutions to try to procure uh, this change to his birth certificate just so he could get a Wisconsin state ID that he needed in order to vote. Um, the second uh, witness that gave really impactful testimony was a woman named Lorraine Hutchins, who at the time of trial was a 93-year-old African-American woman. Um, she sadly passed away a few months after our trial. Um, 
but she testified that she had voted regularly in her native Mississippi in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s. This is during uh, the Mississippi burning era of uh, the civil rights struggle. But because she lacked a state issued photo ID and because she was one of the thousands of folks who lived in Wisconsin who were never issued a birth certificate because she was born at home to a midwife, um, she was at risk of not being able to vote in Wisconsin in 2014, despite having voted in Mississippi in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. Um, it was only because of truly heroic work by her daughter who spent over two years and over $2,000, essentially uh, paying a poll tax, uh, it, that she was finally able to get the birth certificate that she needed in order to vote. Um, and, and I went back and looked at what Ms. Hutchins testified because it was so, so powerful. She said, I'm quoting her, she said, I feel there is a strategy to keep minorities and older people from voting. Most of us who migrated to Northern states do not have birth certificates, a prerequisite for obtaining a photo ID required to vote. I've been voting since the 1940s when I voted for Franklin Delano Roosevelt. It would be devastating to lose the right to vote now after all these years. Um, and so while Mitch, Ms. Hutchins' story does have a happy ending because she did, through the, the work of her daughter, finally get a birth certificate, we know that there were thousands of other folks who have been disenfranchised because they did not have an advocate who was as tenacious as Ms. Hutchins' daughter was in procuring this birth certificate for her. Um, and unfortunately, the story of our trial does not have a happy ending. Um, we won a resounding victory at the district court, but our decision was reversed on appeal and Wisconsin's photo ID law remains largely in effect um, there have been some modifications made to the law for cases of extreme hardship, uh, but the law generally is, is in effect and 35 states now have photo ID laws in effect. Uh, thankfully, New York does not actually. Uh, Kansas does have a photo ID law. And so uh, I wanna pivot now. I've spent most of this time talking about these onerous photo ID requirements, um, but there are many other forms of voter suppression that are, are ongoing today. Uh, the first is moving or closing of polling locations. So since uh, the Civil Rights Act was gutted by the, or sorry, the Voting Rights Act was gutted by the Supreme Court in 2013, we've seen across the country over 1,600 fewer polling locations. Um, so we've seen many polling locations close mostly in urban areas and in communities of color. Uh, in 2018, I was the executive director of the Kansas Democratic Party. And a couple weeks before the election, we learned that uh, the clerk in Dodge City, Kansas, which is a heavily Hispanic community, had decided to close the one polling location uh, in her town and move it to more than a mile outside of, of the city and more than a mile from the nearest bus stop. So we had to spend thousands of dollars uh, to educate voters about this change in polling okay. locations. Okay. We had to I rent would, vans uh, and uh, bus uh, Tell me when it comes. Uh, to, try to, get um, folks, I... to try to get folks to the polling location just so they could exercise uh, their right to vote. Um, we've also seen uh, voter purging. And, and so this is typically when uh, a state will, under the auspices of wanting to clean up their voter rolls, will, uh, will take folks who haven't voted in a certain number of past elections, will strike them from the voter rolls uh, for no reason other than that they haven't participated. Um, they oftentimes don't require any evidence that the person has moved or that they're deceased, uh, but they will just strike them from the rolls. Um, so that's another thing we should be on guard against. And finally, um, I'm really nervous whenever I see ballots being thrown out because of issues with uh, signature matching. So there's a lot of reasons why folks may have a signature that looks different on their driver's license or on their photo ID than how they may sign a poll book or how they may sign an advanced ballot envelope. 
if you think about when you sign your driver's license, it's at, the, it's at the very end of the process, oftentimes after you've been waiting at the DMV for several hours. And so you may not think about that that signature is later going to be compared to your signature on a poll book or your signature on a ballot envelope. Um, you're just trying to quickly sign it and, and get out of the DMV so you can get on with the rest of your day. Um, so I'm always nervous when I hear about ballots uh, being contested because of issues with signature matching. It is, it is almost never uh, indicative of, of actual voter fraud. So uh, let me turn now and I'll talk about sort of a little bit on the bright side. What are some good policies that we've seen adopted in some states that I'm hoping that we will see adopted more broadly? What are some, some good policies we've seen are uh, same day voter registration, so 21 states and the District of Columbia, uh, New York and Kansas, uh, neither one of them have same day voter registration, um, but New, uh, 21 states and DC do, and this would allow folks to go in on the day of the election or during early voting, register to vote, um, or update their address if they've moved since the last election. Um, this is really important because many folks don't really start paying attention until closer to the election. Um, and they may not realize that they need to, to register, that they need to update their address until after the voter registration deadline in their state has passed. Um, so these same day voter registration laws have been a great service for uh, increasing voter participation in the states that have them. Um, one thing that I'm hopeful that we'll see more broadly adopted after 2020 is voting by mail. Um, I don't think we should limit this just to when we're going through a once in a, a century pandemic. I think we've saw really successful elections this year with large increases in voting by mail um, that went really smoothly. So I'm hopeful that we'll see continued adoption uh, more broadly of voting by in future elections. And third, one thing that's really helped improve youth voter turnout is automatic voter registration, where um, we've had uh, states have allowed voters to register to vote when they're 16, and then they are automatically registered uh, when they turn 18. So the day they turn 18, they automatically get added to the voter rolls in their state, and they're sent a voter uh, information card with information about voting. So they don't have to go through a separate registration process when they turn 16. Um, and then finally, I want to end with talking about what are three things that each of us can do uh, in our own lives to help improve voter accessibility. Um, one, I would say, if you could sign up to be a poll worker, this is an incredible service that, that all of us can render. Um, it is so important that we have well-trained, hardworking folks who are in polling locations in their community. So if you're at all able to do that, I think that's a really impactful service that each of us can do. Um, the second is, is know who your local election official is, whether it's your county clerk um, or, or whatever it's called in your community, but know who your local election official is and more importantly, understand whether they are working to improve voter accessibility. Um, what are they doing to make sure that there's enough voting locations, that there's enough poll workers, that there's enough polling machines? Um, how old are the polling machines that are in uh, the election booths in your community? That's something that we should all know. And then finally, we should all pay attention to what our Secretary of State is doing and what are the laws that our state legislature is passing with respect to voting. These uh, Bad voting laws typically get passed in odd numbered years uh, when there's very little fanfare around them. And we typically don't start paying attention to a state's voting laws until about 90 days before an election in even numbered years. So it's really important to know who our Secretary of State is and know if they are uh, doing things to improve voting accessibility in your state or if they're doing things to restrict voting accessibility. Um, and likewise, what laws are, is your state legislature considering with respect to voting accessibility? So I wanna stop there and I'm really glad to take any questions or, or have a conversation about uh, anything I've talked about. So Ethan, hi, 
Uh, first of all, uh, on behalf of the Herjic community, thank you very much for being here. Um, and uh, I want to kind of second your, uh, your first suggestion of being a poll watcher. And I, I would say uh, I finally did that this past uh, election, um, mostly because I was just scared about certain results, which thankfully did not happen. They were good results. Um, and that was a, a really kind of um, American experience for me. So much of my life is in the Jewish community um, and uh, trying to do good for the Jewish community. I felt very American doing that. Um, and that was really a positive feeling and had some like negative interaction also with some people, which was okay because that was like part of the job. So I, uh, I second you on that suggestion. My question to you is, um, on one hand, you told some really positive, I mean, uh, not positive, uh, strong stories about voter suppression and terrible things that happened to these two people, which I'm sure happens, you know, all over um, every election, uh, but how do we um, how do we prevent yeah. possible yeah. fraud yeah. in elections where basically all you have to do is sign your name and you can go in and and vote? Um, and in this day and age of like computers and IDs and all that, um, that seems like a kind of archaic way of ascertaining. Uh, the identity of somebody. Yeah, so it's it's it, it seems that way, but really, if you think about it, committing uh, in-person voter fraud is actually a really hard thing to do, right? Because so think if if I wanted to uh, commit voter fraud and I was going to go impersonate another voter, so I was going to go and I was going to try to vote in Mr. Smith's name. So think about all the steps that I would have to do. So first off, I would have to know Mr. Smith. I would have to know his address. So when I went in there and they asked me, where, where do you live? I would have to be able to give Mr. Smith's address. I would also have to do it before Mr. Smith has voted. So I'd have to make sure that he hasn't already voted and show up at the polling place before he did, giving his address at a polling location that is in his community. So I'd have to be thinking that none of the poll workers or none of the other people at the polling location are going to say, you're not Mr. Smith. Um, and so all of this uh, to commit what is in all 50 states is already a felony. So I would have to be willing to risk uh, committing a felony and, and have all these things happen to be to be going there unrecognized that I'm not Mr. Smith, that Mr. Smith hasn't already voted, to sign a poll book, uh, and then to cast a vote in Mr. Smith's name, which as our expert witnesses testified, um, in social science they call voting a very low return activity which is not to say that we shouldn't all vote, all our friends should vote, we should get your neighbors to vote, your colleagues, but statistically to risk committing a felony, uh, to, to cast one extra vote in an election that the odds are infinitesimally small that your one vote is going to make a difference is actually already quite a deterrent exists to voter fraud. When you think about the number of steps in that process, where it's very likely that somebody would get caught at one of those steps, right? Um, so we actually have a, a fair number of safeguards already built in uh, to the process that makes uh, voter impersonation really unlikely to happen. Okay, thank you. Also, also um, I think you have to remember that when you go in, you have to sign. And if you don't know what that other person's signature looks like, and you're going in, you're gonna to have to sign similarly to that person, that's another deterrent or giveaway. Right. And my question is though, you hear about all these, you know, you hear about accusations of dead people voting. When somebody does pass away, how is the Board of Election notified or are they notified? How does that work? It's, it's imperfect. They're supposed to be, 
looking at obituaries um, and taking people off the voter rolls. Um, what you read about is times where they're not perfect in taking every person off immediately after they die. There are right. some people who stay on voter rolls for some period of time, but they're not voting uh, and nobody is voting in their name. So what you'll hear about is, oh, this person has been dead for a month and they're still on the voter rolls. Yeah. Occasionally that is the case, but they're, they're not voting and nobody is voting right. on their behalf. Okay, thank you. Ethan, you mentioned problems in Wisconsin and other problems in Kansas. Do you think if the United States did not do things state by state that we would be in better shape if there would be a uniform voting set of regulations for the entire country rather than go state by state? Yeah, it is a challenge that we have our, our, our laws, um, you know, we have national elections, but they're administered at such a state and local level with very, very different uh, laws, different kinds of machines, uh, di ballots that look very differently. Um, it's, it is a very challenging patchwork of an election system that makes it very complicated. Um, on the other hand, in this day and age, it has probably afforded some protections from a cybersecurity perspective because there is not one centralized, you know, voting database that anybody could hack into. If you wanted to try to do any sort of uh, hack from a cyber perspective, you would have to really be able to infiltrate each state's individual election infrastructure. So that is not why the system is like it is, but in this era, it has actually become somewhat of a, a helpful, a fortunate accident from a cybersecurity perspective that there is not one centralized uh, elections uh, database. But certainly from a legal and law perspective, I think we would all benefit from more uniform application of voting laws uh, across the 50 states. Ethan, is there a country in um democratic country in the world that has great voting protections that we can I, learn from? Yeah, that's a great question. I actually don't know uh, that much about what other countries are doing. Um, I know that we tend to require more photo identification than other countries. Um, so I, I'm obviously not in favor of, of those sorts of restrictions. I think we're one of the few countries that has uh, those onerous uh, restrictions with very few hardship exemptions. Um, but I don't know somebody who's doing it particularly well. That would be an interesting research project though. And I'm gonna just ask another question. I'm sorry, folks. Uh, so I live in New Jersey where uh, the governor X weeks before the election said, everybody's gonna be mailed a ballot um, to do at home. Um, and so everybody got a ballot at home. Uh, and there were some people amongst my, like Pepper and my friends who were a little concerned about what it means to mail something in or where do you mail it or how do you do it as opposed to going to an election you know, uh, place and actually casting a vote. So do you think it was a good idea to, um, to mail ballots to everybody? And do you see that as a possible future in our elections that people automatically get mail-in ballots? Yeah, there are some states, Oregon and Wisconsin, or Oregon and Washington state have been doing, uh, for several cycles now, have been doing their elections entirely by mail. Um, they've had a very smooth uh, process. Their voters are very used to this. Like anything, whenever there's a change, there is a certain adjustment period. But I am hopeful that one of the few good things that will happen out of 2020 and out of this experience we've had with COVID um, is that uh, we will be able to have more folks uh, accessible, uh, make voting more accessible for more folks because we will more broadly adopt mail-in. And I'm hopeful that we will keep some of these things that were enacted that were COVID specific, I'm hopeful that we'll, maybe we'll tweak them a little bit, but generally speaking that we'll keep them in future elections because 
I do think it allowed a lot of folks to participate, older folks who aren't able to secure a ride to the, poli to the polls, folks who don't want to go stand in line, they may not feel healthy enough to stand in line, even without the concerns around COVID, they just may not feel health healthy enough to stand in line for a certain period of time. So I really think it was overall a real positive and I'm hopeful that states will take the good parts of what happened and incorporate them into their laws. There obviously needs to be a voter education piece around that um, to educate voters. And so I think states who do that need to spend some money and resources in, in explaining to folks what they're doing around voting and what changes they're making. Um, one thing that my county did that I think was really helpful um, that I thought was a great step was there were a lot of folks who wanted to have the ballot sent to them, but they were then nervous about putting it back in the mail because they were hearing things about mail being delayed and they were just very nervous about that. So what our county did that I think was a great model that, that should be adopted is they put eight ballot drop boxes across the county. And so these were, were not USPS, they were not part of the mail system. They were only for ballots and they were located all across the county. So they were roughly accessible to everybody had one fairly close to them. And they would only be opened by the election office and they were only for ballots. And so if you felt like you were worried about the postal system, you could take your ballot to one of those ballot only drop boxes and put it in there. And so that way you would know that it had been received uh, by the election office. You could also complete your ballot and you could bring it into an early voting location and drop it off there. Um, you could bring it into your a polling location, any polling location, didn't have to be your assigned one, any polling location on election day. And you were able to go onto their website and track whether your ballot had been received. So the county set up a really great website where you could put in first name, last name, date of birth, and they would show your ballot's been mailed. Then they would show your ballot's been received by the election office. Your ballot's been, been counted. Your ballot's been run through the machine. So folks had this comfort that hey, did my, did my ballot get there? Did it not? And so folks were able to do that. So folks who were comfortable mailing it had that option, but there were also several ways for folks to complete and return their ballot if they didn't want to use the mail system. So I thought that was a great model that I think other counties should adopt. We had similar, similar thing in New York, or at least in Nassau here, just without the uh, computer tracking. But, but the Dropbox thing, or you could bring it to any early uh, or early polling place or want to bring it in on election day. It's very discouraging for some of us to read about uh, voter de depression, suppression, which is taking place uh, just right in the, in the open. For instance, in, in Georgia, I've read about, uh, they feel that ma mail-in voting has uh, increased the minority vote. So they, and this is, they've had mail-in voting for a while, they're going to, uh, the legislature is thinking about uh, to taking away mail-in voting. And they just cut uh, so many people from the voting rolls uh, before the last gubernatorial election. Uh, similarly in Florida, where uh, the state had voted on a referendum and people had voted to let uh, ex-felons uh, vote. Uh, and, and now the, uh, they're saying they must pay all their legal bills uh, all their fines rather to, to the state. And sometimes these, uh, these amounts were unknown, uh, it, directly contrary to, to the will of the people in voting uh, that these people could vote. W what can we do about some of these things? So what are the best organizations to support uh, to uh, fight against voter suppression, especially of this blatant sort? Yeah, yeah, I mean, Georgia has been sort of ground zero for this. I mean, Georgia, I talked about voter purging. Georgia was, uh, home to one of the largest voter purges before the 2018 uh, statewide election. They purged 8% of uh, their eligible voters were purged. Um, over 108,000 voters uh, were purged before the election for no other reason than that they hadn't voted in several past elections. There was no 
uh, requirement that the state show that these folks had moved, that they were registered somewhere else, that they were deceased. Um, they simply, it was what they called a use it or lose it provision, um, which said that if you've not used your right to vote in a certain number of the previous elections, we're just gonna take you off the voter rolls um, and make you re-register uh, again, which I talked about how cumbersome that process is. Um, you pointed out the challenges that Florida's had. Um, I think Fair Fight Action is doing a lot of really good work uh, around the country. This is uh, the group that Stacey Abrams, uh, who ran for governor in Georgia in 2018, uh, the group that she organized, I think they are probably doing the best work um, around the country in trying to combat voter suppression. I think that's a great organization for folks to contribute to their efforts. Um, they're, they're continually trying to expand into more and more states. Uh, there's an organization called Let America Vote uh, that has a really interesting model, which is um, they are not really doing the legal end of this as much, but they are actually uh, targeting politicians who are supporting laws that make it harder for people to vote. And they are trying to get them out of office. So they're trying to uh, fund their opponents. They're trying to uh, publicize within their districts um, that these folks, that your, your elected representative is actually doing things to make it harder um, for folks to, to vote. So Let America Vote is another great organization. Um, not surprisingly, uh, the ACLU was a partner for us in this case in Wisconsin. Uh, they've been a partner in most of the most significant um, legal challenges. Uh, so the ACLU is another organization that is a great organization to support that has been really at the forefront as far as the uh, in-court legal defense of voting rights. So those are three organizations, each of which have let America Vote has sort of the model where they're targeting the actual politicians. The ACLU is really leading the actual in-court legal fight. Um, and Fair Fight Action is doing a lot on the communications, messaging, uh, voter registration, voter turnout front. So those are three organizations that are really combating this, each from a slightly different angle, um, but all of which are really worthy of support. Thank you. I don't have a question, but I have a couple of comments. I remember when I registered to vote when I was 18, and a few months later, my mother said, oh, you know what? A police officer came to the house and was asking for me. And of course, she got very scared. And the reason he asked for me is that I just registered to vote and wanted to make sure that I lived there. You know, I was in college, but I, you know, I, I still lived at home. And also, I, we used to be very active in the Democratic Club in Brooklyn, um, you know, when I, in the early 80s. And you know, uh, would help with the signatures, and there would be people actually seeing how many they could eliminate um, because of the way the handwriting wasn't filled out completely. You know, for the, to get somebody on the ballot, that was a big thing about that. So yeah, I, I again, yeah, as I mentioned, I'm, I'm always, uh, you know, my ears always perk up when we're talking about signature requirements and signature matching because uh, that historically has been for for decades uh, used to try to to strike ballots and, and strike candidates from ballots. And uh, oftentimes very little evidence of, of it actually being connected to, to fraud. So anytime I hear about signature requirements, I think we should all uh, be sort of on guard for potential voter suppression. But as, as somebody put it, voter suppression has been going on since they invented voting. There's been people trying to figure out how to stop certain groups of people from voting. So this is something that's been going on since, you know, Greek and Roman times. Um, and so we always constantly need to be on guard against it. But it increasingly looks like we think of voter suppression as, you know, burning crosses and things that happened during the, the height of the civil rights struggle. The modern day voter suppression looks a lot like government bureaucracy and government inefficiency and what happened to Mr. Holloway. And so I think there is a tendency among folks to think about voter suppressions not happening anymore because the Klan is not showing up at your house um, or things like that. But there is still, um, whether it's what's going on with uh, ex-felons or whether it's what's going on with voter purging, there's still many ways, um, often through instruments of government bureaucracy where folks are, are being uh, having their right to vote suppressed. <laughs> 
in, in Barack Obama's new book, he talks about signatures when he was running for state senator a couple of years ago, and he had to get four times the recommended amount of signatures just so that they wouldn't scratch off so many that he'd have enough. So, uh, yeah, I, I like to say you did a good job, but I'm a little partial. <laughs> well, I'm going to put some links to some articles in the chat that I think are interesting for folks who want to do any additional um, digging on the on this. Um, some of the articles from our trial. Um, Can I thing, talk I'll, to you while you're typing, Ethan? Yeah. The two people that you gave specific examples of were incredibly persistent about getting the right to vote. How many people do you think are not that persistent and unfortunately lose their right because of the bureaucracy? Uh, what percentage hundreds, would you estimate? Hundreds of thousands. Uh, hundreds of thousands. Uh, probably in every state. There's. I, I put a link to couple articles here that talk about the impact of uh, Wisconsin's photo ID law. Um, there's one article that estimated that about 200,000 folks were stopped from voting in Wisconsin because of the photo ID law. Um, there's a, another study that had, had less than that, but there's no doubt that there are, are many, many laws um, that are designed uh, that, that actually do have an effect. In Georgia, as I mentioned, it was 8% of the electorate. Um, was struck from the, the voting rolls during their large voter purge. Um, in Kansas, we had a, a proof of citizenship requirement that finally it was, it was struck down at every level, but, while, but it was estimated that, uh, so in Kansas, in order to register to vote, you had to prove that you were a U.S. citizen, um, which again went back to having to get a birth certificate and all the things that we've talked about. Uh, so in Kansas, they estimated that 30,000 folks were denied uh, the ability to register to vote, 30,000 eligible voters. Um, so it, the numbers are, are large, uh, very large and, and very significant. One thing okay. that I will flag that we should all be on guard for as well as we head into redistricting um, is voter suppression through gerrymandering. And, and so that's going to be coming up uh, this year and next year once we have the results of the census. Um, all of our local uh, district lines will be redrawn. All of our federal district lines will be redrawn. Um, and th those are opportunities uh, that are ripe for voter suppression activity when we go through the redistricting process. So I would, I would just, you know, uh, folks, that's also something folks should pay attention for. Yeah, I was going to say, having done some work with the census, I don't believe that we had an accurate count. So I think that is definitely going to have a negative impact um, on the way that certain groups, populations uh, are represented in the future because they were not counted. Yeah. So we know that there's big undercounting of minority populations, probably more so in this census than ever before because of fear among folks in those communities. Um, and you know, the, the, the two things that we'll see um, potentially are what they call packing. Uh, so there's packing and, and cracking. So packing is when they will try to put um, all of, of a particular community into one district. So they get one representative when they really should, if they were spread out properly, they may have two, three, four, five. They'll try to draw the line so they'll put, you know, so if they wanted to put all of the Hispanics into one district and say, fine, you can have one representative. They'll draw the line to try to make one district where all the Hispanics are. So it really dilutes their representation. When if the lines were more fairly drawn, they would have more than one. So that's packing. Um, there's also cracking where you try to deliberately break up certain populations so they are spread out enough that they cannot actually elect anybody. Um, so you'll hear the terms packing and cracking when it comes to, to gerrymandering. So those are two things that, that we should all be on, on guard for. All right, Ethan, thank you very much. Very illuminating thank you. talk, very thank relevant you. to our modern age, unfortunately. And 
for our audience. If you've liked today's session, I hope you'll join us next week. Rebecca Anton Oster will be speaking about the power of a kind word. And then we have a bunch of speakers lined up for January and February as well. Ethan, good luck. When does your term actually start? January 1st? January 11th is when we're January sworn 11th. in. All right. Good luck. Good luck. Good luck. Thank you. Good luck. Keith, Thank you. Just want to let everybody know if 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 you wanted to uh, look at those uh, websites that uh, Ethan put up and hadn't had the opportunity to copy them, I, I copied them all. I can put them in an email to you. So if you want them, just send me an email and I'll respond with those with all of those uh, that he posted back to you.